the White House would decide it would be electrotherapy because it had running water and it had power. And um, so we said, OK, it's a possibility. And so then they leased it, apparently. And we went, um, and that was December the 4th, we had this meeting where we were suggesting that um, they ought to advertise overseas to get proper teachers to come for the school and also that it would be perhaps advantageous to the whole country if the intake to Dunedin was in February and they would call it qualify in the November and the Auckland one would start in, say, June and they would qualify in May. So there would be an even a distribution of new graduates coming out. And that Jim Powell said, well, that's fine, but 120 people applied to Dunedin this year for physiotherapy. 60 have been selected for Dunedin and 60 have been notified for selection to Auckland. So there are 60 students waiting to come. So we've got to start. The latest we can start is March, so I said. But, so I remember walking out with an application form in each hand with both arms tied behind my back and saying, but I've got a new department, I want to use my new department. And so I thought, right, I'll put in an application, and when they offer me a tutor grade one, I will send it, say, sorry, but I don't want it. You know? I thought, well, then they can't say I haven't, didn't offer my services. We had the interviews on a Thursday, I think it was the 22nd of December. About 21 people applied, and they had an interview panel, including Glenn Park, Ivan Moses, I think was there, who was the principal of AIT then, Jim Powell, and I think they had Ross Nicholson on because he was, and this is something you might have to edit, he was not keen on physios. And we thought that by having him on the panel that we would butter him up so that he couldn't then say he didn't agree with it because we'd got him involved. And um, and then the following day we all got telegram, those who was, I, I don't know if everyone got a telegram, but I know I got a telegram to say, I'd been appointed a tutor grade three and tutor in charge. So I thought, oh, well, that's cooked my goose. But I ha didn't know, and the phone went, and Barry Tate, who was the physical medicine specialist, rang up and said, congratulations. I said, on what? <laughs> and he knew before I did that I'd got the post. So then went and offered my resignation to the um, medical superintendent, who was very good and let me go with only one month's notice rather than the three and went back and saw the staff and they said what's the matter you don't look very happy I said no I'm leaving and they said why where are you going so I said I'm going to the school they said what school <laughs> kind of thing and um, so but I had a very supportive staff there then and it was very good and so um, we all started on the 31st of January 1973 we all met at Wellesley Street to be greeted by Ivan Moses who always gave us talk to the assembled staff and a few years after years of this we soon realized it, it was always inter interspersed with folks people my, my good people and, so, and we used to play cricket and so if it was a folks it was four if it was people it was six and we used to get the score at the end of it you see. So we were very, a little bit um, irreligious or, you know, and he made, and he introduced all the new staff and we all had to stand up and be introduced to the staff. And then we had to go out to Grafton in the pouring rain. And there were three groups of students there. There was physio, there was the secretarial girls and business uh, administration. And we were all in the cafeteria and we were being introduced to all the staff and there was Miss, uh, the secretarial woman, I can't remember her name, and Harry Durban was the commerce and they were both about five foot four and rather round and there was me standing up and, I, and we actually stood up and I had two of them on either side of me and I laughed like, you know. anyway, before that we had, it was the month I was at Middlemore, we had to put in requisitions for equipment such as electrical equipment we had to find someone to make plinths wooden plinths for us and we had to local get those locally 
we, pillows were fine, pillowcases were fine, and when we took the cost of blankets into account, and they were all big ones, we, we thought we couldn't afford those, so we went and got off cups from the Anihanga woolen mills, and Barbara, Mother's, uh, Barbara Miller's mother's reading circle blanket stitched them for us. And I made the curtains for the White House, and so on Jan- March the 19th we started and we were carrying pillows and things like that. And we had John Carmen from the Department of Anatomy was doing the anatomy with Martin Reeve. We asked Jack Sinclair, who was the professor of physiology, if he would help, and he declined. And I was very pleased in 1994, when I was going around saying goodbye to people at the med school, he said, what a pity we didn't take up that offer it would have been ideal for us because we had then Paul Hill who was the head of physiology and they were trying to get more students in and we were chatting to him one day and he said well how about some of your students coming to do masters and that's when Andrea and Lynn went over and started the the masters at the med school and Wayne Hing I think joined them and so that was the start of getting those masters going so that we'd have people with higher qualifications teaching in the school. And I thought, what a pity he hadn't let us go in to start off with. Anyway, Ian Turner taught physics, Wayne Donovan taught physiology, and he was doing his um, doctorate in the transportation of urine in the New Zealand earwig. And we thought, what a hilarious topic, but never mind, you know, he got his doctorate and that was it. So the first year was pure theory and practice in the school. Then we went out to negotiate with the clinical people to allow students to come in. And on the whole, they were very good. But I always remember uh, going to one hospital and someone said, we didn't ask for the school to come here, so why should we have students? I said, well, who helped you when you were started off? And they said, yes, we, we did. So we said, well, you know, just think... If you, no one had helped you, you wouldn't be here today. And anyway, it all calmed down and they accepted students. And then we got all our students into clinical placements within the Auckland area. Um, so at the end of the second year, where they did, they were in school in the morning and clinical in the afternoon. Third year, we swapped it around. Third years went out in the morning and second years were in school. And in the third year, they went out not only to Auckland, Middlemore, Green Lane, and North Shore. I don't think North Shore was open then, but those were the main ones, and the rehab centre. And then they went out to other units, um, smaller units in the um, mornings, like the rehab uh, rehab centre, the artificial limb centre, um, Wilson Home for crippled children over on the shore. So they got more sophisticated treatment uh, opportunities then. In the second year, we'd held a few back because they hadn't met the desired status of, for the exams. We'd ha- held one back in first year, the only one, and he repeated first year. And he was at the reunion the other day and is now a master and working in um, Melbourne. And... Uh, in the third year, we put 43 students in for the state exams. We gave them a, a, pra- a, 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 a practice one, and they, we said, well, they've all passed, you know. So who are we to say, to say they can't go in? So we put them all in, all 43 of them. And then they had to sit there. We hadn't got a, a bit room big enough up at Grafton, so they had to go down to Wellesley Street to sit the writtens. So we provided them all with polos to keep their sugar levels up. (laughs) And they did the writtens, then they came up and we had the practicals in the White House. And we had two examiners, external examiners, Joan Durbridge and Beryl Ingram. And they could ask them anything and and then all of a sudden, in one afternoon, all the power went. So I had to go and say, we've lost power. Not only did we lose power in the building, but the power, the fuses on the power lines outside in the road had gone. So there was no power for the rest of that day. 
And I looked again, looked over the shoulder of Joan Durbridge, and there was one of her students grinning from ear to ear, eyes coming out on stalks. She'd just been asked to do an ionisation, so she wouldn't have to do it. And so she grinned, and I often think there was some divine inspiration from on high that pulled the plug or something, because all that electrotherapy stuff, they weren't able to ask them. So, Anyway, all 43 of them passed. And in those days, the examiners came and interviewed the head of school. And I had both of them with me, and they say they didn't like the uniforms. They passed them all, but um, the Joan, uh, not Joan, uh, Beryl said she didn't know if it, this was the right thing to do because it was all you should always have bell curves and things, and so we should have failed a five percent. So I said, why? If they passed, they passed. If they meet the standard you've set, they passed. And I was having a good old ding dong with them, and then. Um, Joan, my secretary, had typed up the list and run through the library and pinned it up on the notice board. And then all of a sudden there was a silence. There was a murmur going on outside. Then there was a silence. Then there was a roar. And the students discovered every one of them had passed. And so the noise was uncontrollable outside. And then Jan Thompson came and knocked on the door and said, it's no good, the students want to see you. Would you please come out? And the examiner said, that's all right, you go. Bye-bye. And left. And so, and that that night, I think we had the barbecue. We we decided we'd give a barbecue to the students because they'd survived. Or was it the first year we gave it to them? Because they'd survived the year. And after that, we had a tradition of a barbecue at the end of the year, and then prize giving. And in those days, a lot of the students had bursaries from the health department, which meant that they had to do two years working for the health department in specific areas. And so it was absolutely instantaneous. As soon as we got the results, went through and down to Wellington, then we got a telephone call back with all the placements. And even the other week, someone said, what did you say to the people in the physiotherapy board that made them send me to Invercargill? I said, I didn't say a word. They just placed you, and so that was it. And so, even after all these years, people are asking, how did we get selected, and how did we get sent to all those places? <laughs> and so that was the end of our first year, which was always a memorable year. And then we carried on, and gradually over the years we had more clinical placements. And then in the latter years we had to go further afield to get them, such as Rotorua, Wanganui, New Plymouth, Wakatani, Gisborne, Taronga, up to Wangarei, and so we, we, that's where we spread out because they couldn't take them. And it was, um, they were deciding that the place was really too small for us, and I think it was in 1973, 4, 75 that nursing came and joined us at, well, at Grafton, and then about 1980 they were talking about finding somewhere else for us to go and then it must have been 1981 it was decided to amalgamate the North Shore Teachers College with the one in Epsom so that building would be empty so Yvonne Shadbolt who was the head of nursing and I went over with Jim Powell again and um, because by now he was deputy principal at AIT and uh, looked at the North Shore and we thought that that would do us. <laughs> and the nursing department moved over at the beginning of 1983 because they didn't need as much room and we were going to take the art department, which was downstairs. And so we took the art department and we had three big rooms with two little rooms in between, then another big room at the back. We said we wanted a hydrotherapy pool and we had to meet with the Department of Education Architects and so we were trying to persuade them that we wanted a large pool and one of the guys said well, he'd been to the local physiotherapy department and the pool there was only 10 metres, no, 10 feet by 6 feet or something like that so why did we want one metres long? And we said well we have classes of 20 and we've got to put 10 people in and ten people acting as the therapist and ten people acting as models. Oh, well, 
And they said, well, can't you do it in the small ones? So I said, no, because we'd have to repeat the class 20 times. <laughs> And I said, and, you know, that would mean we'd need more tutors and that would mean more expense than putting in a pool. And so they said, oh, we don't know. So I went home that night and drew a diagram on graph paper explaining, you know, how we laid the pool and handed it to them the next day. And they said, all right, OK, we will consider it. And Jim Powell came up to me and said, since when have all your students been six foot tall? <laughs> because I'd drawn it, you know, in as large as I could. And give him his due, not many, not all people got on with Jim Powell, but he was very supportive of the physiotherapy school. And when we went over to Akaranga, he was the person in charge, and then the two heads of schools. Unfortunately, he got leukaemia, and he died. Um... Then Jane, John Hinchcliffe came along and he always was trying to say, we never use the room, There's too, we've got too much space and wanted all that bottom corridor divided up for other people to come in. And I used to spend my time with my elbows out like this, saying, no, we need it, you only come on the wrong days and the sudden then. So we kept it. And then as we came up to get in the degree, I thought we've got to get some accurate measuring devices. So jumped up and down to get the Kincom and so got the Kincom um, much to everyone's horror because it was so expensive anyway we got it and installed it and then someone told John that no one was ever using it so it was accused of being a white elephant so I said it will get used it will get used and, um, and then we enticed Peter McNair over and Peter Hamer and then we, and in the same time, we were doing all these writing programs for a degree. The first one we wrote was three and a half years, and then they, we put that forward, and they said, no, that wasn't acceptable. It didn't give enough time for the staff to do research, so we had to do four years. And then the Department of Education wouldn't finance it, so we had to bring it back to three years. And then the physiotherapy board wouldn't approve anyone who hadn't gone through a four-year programme. So it had to go up to four years again. And we started without funding for the fourth year. And so the students would have to pay for it at that stage. But fortunately, by the time we got to the fourth year, the Department of Education decided to fund it. Because the physiotherapy board said, we won't um, register anyone. So it was a real hodgepodge of things that going on. And um, so we got the degree, I think it was in 1992 or so. And uh, then I left in 1994. We had already been doing an advanced diploma in manual therapy, even when we had the diploma. We did the advanced diploma. And, um, and then we started, we were already working on getting a master's going when I left. And so I'm very pleased to see that it's carried on and everyone's doing all the things they should be doing. <laughs>